We've been in a sermon series the last few weeks titled Climate Change. Climate Change. The whole idea behind this sermon series is that you, that you and I would grow in understanding how we can change some things in our lives to grow. I want to grow in God. I want to grow in favor with God. I want to grow in understanding with God. I want to know more about God. I want to experience God more. And so that's the whole idea behind this sermon series. I want to know what God is blessing, and I want to do the things that God is blessing. How many of you want to be blessed today? If you want to be blessed, just say amen. Amen. I want to be blessed. And so my message this morning is a climate of blessing. That's what I want to preach this morning, a climate of blessing. Now, To start this off, I really want to come from the other side of that, the side that isn't blessed. I want to come from that side so I can set up the climate, the idea of living a blessed life. And we'll begin with this story from 2 Samuel 6, verse 3. I'll read several verses of Scripture. It says, And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab. Now, To set this up, the Ark of the Covenant, if you're not familiar with the Ark of the Covenant, it was a box that had been built to be in the tabernacle in the wilderness, the very first tabernacle that was built in the Old Testament. God instructed them to build this box, cover it with gold, put the angels on top of it. There was a mercy seat there, and it was considered God's throne. It was considered the mercy seat, the judgment seat. The tables of stone were actually put inside the box. And so this is what the Ark of the Covenant is, and it represents the presence of God. There, it's not an idol that represents God. It is a, a throne, if you will, that represents where the presence of God would rest. And so the Philistines, Israel's enemy, had stolen the Ark in a battle. And in that battle, God uh, allowed them to steal it. But then when they took that Ark and they put it in their own temple, God began to curse them. And so they sent it back to Israel. When they sent it back to Israel, it just got put in somebody's house. And when David became the king, and so this is 20 or 40 years later, David becomes the king over Judah. He decides, I want the ark. I want the ark of the covenant because it represents the presence of God. I want to be close to God. And so this is the idea of going after it. Now, when David decided to go after it, he took with him 30,000 soldiers to go after it. Now, it was already in Israel, and he didn't have to capture it. He just wanted to celebrate bringing it back to Jerusalem. So he took the royal family down there, and he took all of his friends, and he took the leaders, the government leaders, and 30,000 soldiers. And they all go down to Abinadab's house, and they decide to bring back the ark. And it says, And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart. Now, this had been in his home, and his sons had been raised around this, and they were driving this cart. So they made a cart to carry it back to Jerusalem. Now, when God gave them the ark, he instructed them to put rings on the side of it, and they were to put staves through the rings, and the Levites would carry the ark on their shoulders. When the Philistines sent it back to Israel, they put it on a cart, a a, a car that was driven by cattle and just sent it back to Israel. They didn't want anything to do with it. God allowed them to get away with that. But now they're using this cart and they're not doing what God has asked them to do. They haven't put the staves of the rings. The Levites are not carrying on their shoulders. They have the ark of God and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And they're just having this great celebration, worshiping God around this ark that represented the very presence of God. It's a beautiful thing, and it's what we should do. It's why we come to the house of God to worship, because we want to experience the presence of God. Worship is a great part of the Bible. You see it in every part of the Bible. But watch what happens. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. Let me back up this verse here. And when, the, when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put forth his hand and touched the ark and took hold of it because the oxen had stumbled. And so the oxen are pulling this cart, and one of them stumbles. And the, and the, the wagon, if you will, shakes. And Uzzah is afraid that it's going to fall off and get messed up. And so he reaches forward just to steadle it. But then it says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. This had been in this house all of his life. He'd been around it all of his life. 
He'd probably touched it before. But now this time he touches it, and God kills him there. And the next verse says, And David became angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? And so in our reading today, the way this would apply to us is, How can I get the presence of God to surround me? I want that. What greater blessing could you or I have in our lives than to have the presence of God all around us? I want to be in the presence of God. I want to experience the presence of God. I want the presence of God in me. I just want to overflow with the presence of God. And this is the question that David has. How can I get the ark of the Lord to come to me? It's an important question. It's a question that we should ask. There is a way to come to God and there is a way not to come to God. I want to I make sure you understand, though, that God did not just strike Uzzah dead because he was having a bad day. God's not just up in heaven thinking, man, I'm miserable today, I'm moody today. Uzzah touched the Ark of the Covenant, boom, you're dead. That's not how it went down. There had to be something in Uzzah's life that made God curse him in this way. There was a reason that God struck him down. Jeremiah says it like this, and go not out after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands. Uzzah had reached out with his hand to touch the ark. And he says, I will do you no heart. And, and yet he says, you have not hearkened to me, saith the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Now, the idea of this works of your hands, it's a a literary tool, if you will. It's not just about what you do with your hands. In this case, they were talking about creating idols. But for you and I, it's the idea of our life, who we are. The works of my hands is, is what I do for a career, whether that's teaching or being an attorney or, or laying pipe. Whatever your career is, that is what you do with your hands. But it's more than just your career. It's the way you conduct yourself with other people. It's what you watch on TV, read in the newspaper, research on the Internet. It's all of what you are, the works of your hands. And so David, seeing this, wants to know God. And as he's asking the question, who can come before the Lord? And so if you like to write in the margins of your Bible, next to that 2 Samuel chapter 6, write this passage of Scripture, Psalms 24. And here's why you should write that. Because Bible scholars believe that David wrote Psalms 24 in response to what happened to Uzzah being struck dead. David, in his desire to know God and be close to God, says, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? David feeling this guy that he was close to was just struck down. Uzzah was close to the Ark of the Covenant for a reason. There was 30,000 people there, and yet he was able to be close to the Ark. And yet he is struck down. And David says, here's David's answer, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Uzzah had reached out with his hand and touched the ark that represented the presence of God, and he struck down. And David says, who can approach the hill of God? And he answers his own question. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to do what is false and does not swear deceitfully. This is the idea that you and I would come before God with clean hands. I want to be a person who has a clean life before God. And, and I, I'll show you this in a moment, that David reveals to us that it is clean hands that bring the blessing of God on our lives. It's clean hands. So let me just bring this around to where we are in our culture today. Over the last couple of years, hand washing has become extremely popular. It hasn't always been popular, though. It hasn't been. I was startled as I was reading, as I was studying this week and did a little bit of research, and I found an article from a newspaper in England. And the, the writer was talking about the fact that in the early 1800s, they didn't wash their hands at all. Like that was not a thing. You didn't wash your hands because they didn't know about germs. They didn't understand that you would spread germs to one person or another. But in, 18, in the 1840s, there was a guy who was over a hospital in Vienna, the Vienna General Hospital, a Hungarian-born guy named Ignaz Simmelweis. I'm guessing if I've said that right. Ignaz Simmelweis. Here's what he noticed. And this is, this is perplexing. In the maternity ward where the doctors were working, one out of every five mothers would die giving birth. Those are not good odds. How would you like to give birth in those odds? One out of every five would die. 
20% are dying. In the maternity ward where the midwives were, were helping the moms give birth, there was a much better rate, but not significantly better. It was a little bit better. And so he wanted to know, okay, why are the midwives having fewer deaths than the doctors are having? And so he began to watch everything that they were doing. And one of the things that he noticed was the doctors in training would be in the morgue dissecting a body. And then they would go from the morgue dissecting the body up to the maternity ward and give birth to a baby without washing their hands. And he saw one day that there was a student who, while dissecting the body, accidentally cut himself. And that student ended up dying of the same infection that the cadaver had. And he realized there was a connection. And so he decided there must be something in the cadaver that is on the hands of the doctor that is being transferred to the mom and the mother is dying of the same problem. And so he decided to come up with a rule that they had to wash their hands. Now imagine that today, you have to have a rule to wash their hands. In fact, there still is a rule today that you have to wash your hands, thank God. In, in fact, in this study that I read, only 90% of doctors actually follow the rules, so I hope you don't have the 10% who don't. So uh, <laughs> there are doctors in the house today. Um, so he, he, just, he made this rule, okay, you have to use this chlorine wash to wash your tools, and you have to use this chlorine wash to wash your hands, and the rate of death fell dramatically almost to zero in those maternity wards just because he had them washing their hands. But here's the sad part of the story. The doctors came from the upper side of town. They were from the upper class. They didn't think that it was possible that they could be carrying such a horrific disease. They thought they were too clean for that. They were too pure. They were too educated for that. They were too uppity for that. And so they fired Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis. They just fired him because they didn't like it, and they went back to not washing their hands. And mothers started dying again. Can you imagine being in that era? It wasn't another 10, 15, 20 years that they began to discover germs and how germs affect us and that you actually pick up germs everywhere you go. Every time you reach for a doorknob or you're typing on your keyboard or, or using a debit card machine, wherever you are, you're picking up germs and they began to discover these. And so hand washing came into fashion. And so in the early 1900s, they began to require doctors to wash their hands before doing surgeries. And, and so it became a thing. But then in the 1960s, there was this hippie crowd that decided they didn't like being told what to do and so they began to push back against hand washing kind of a crazy thing and they began to push back against hand washing and so when covid broke out hand washing was not in vogue we don't think about that much but it really wasn't and so whenever the the scientists and the metal expert medical experts came out to say okay here's what we need you to do to keep from spreading COVID, and we're all expecting them to give us a great scientific answer, and the great scientific answer was, wash your hands. Wash your hands. <laughs> it's, it's kind of humorous when you think about it, but the, the sad part is, it, it's still something that you and I need to do. They were talking about washing your hands in the natural realm, but when you look at the wilderness tabernacle, the tabernacle in the wilderness, right after the the altar where they sacrificed the animals. The very next thing was the labor of washing. It was a spiritual element to it. They would wash their hands in the physical, but there was a spiritual component to it. And that is what has to happen for you and me today to have the spiritual component in our lives that we are continually washing our hands. Why? Because as I go about my life and I'm communicating with people and I'm going to work and I'm going home and I'm hearing things on the radio and I'm seeing things on the internet and I'm, I'm seeing things on TV or reading things in a book and I'm having conversations with people, I am picking up all the germs of life. And I don't want to be that person who thinks that he is so good and so righteous and so holy that he doesn't think that he can be infected with germs. And I'm a, as a result of it, I am working with unclean hands. I don't want to be that way. I want to be the individual that says, you know what? I don't know what I'm picking up in my life, but I just want to wash my hands. And I want to be able to do what Paul said in 1 Timothy. In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands, lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. That's what I want to have in my life, to lift up holy hands before God. And it comes from being a a person who says continually I just want to be clean before God can I see what's on my hands no I can't see the germs that are on my hands but I want to come and be clean before God I want I want that 
Something that we see in restaurants. At least I hope you see them in restaurants. If you don't see this sign in a restaurant, don't go back there. But when you go to the restroom, when you're leaving, on the back of the door or somewhere near the door, will be a sign. A sign that reads, employees must wash their hands before returning to work. There's something in me that says they shouldn't need that sign. Right? Like, if that sign needs to be there, what kind of people are you hiring? And yet we do put that sign there for a reason. And here's, this is going to bother you today. I guarantee every one of you will wash your hands several times over the next few hours. They did a study, and here's what the study showed. That when ladies go to use the restroom, only 7 out of 10 will wash their hands when they leave. Three of you. (laughs) So if I fist bump you today, I just don't know if you're one of the three or one of the seven. It gets worse. Only four out of ten men. Only four. It's really bad. I'll be fist bumping everybody today. (laughs) Why do we need that? We shouldn't need that sign there. But we do need that sign there. We, we need that. And, and, and I mentioned earlier that, that 10% of doctors actually fail to follow this, even though they are significantly trained while they're going to medical school, how important and how valuable it is. They have to put the same signs up in hospitals to remind people. And this is why you and I need it in our lives, that this would just be something that we are. I don't want to come into church on Sunday morning wanting to be made clean. I need for this to be a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday thing where every day I'm just saying, Father, I want you to clean me. I want you to purify me. I want you to wash my life because I'm picking up all the junk of this world. And there's a lot of junk in this world. You, don't, you, you cannot isolate yourself from all that is in this world. And this is how David said, he said, Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me because I know you love me. Because of your great compassion, I want you to blot out my sins. this, This is David's prayer. He says, wash me clean from guilt. Purify me from my sin. Just just pause right there. Remember the doctors who were too arrogant to think that they could possibly be carrying germs? David says, wash me clean from my, purify me from my sin, purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. But sometimes I, I don't even know that I've done anything wrong. But because he's a holy God, and we are not holy people, we pray, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a, a loyal spirit within me. And here's why you need to pray that prayer all the time. Because Jesus says in Matthew 5.20, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness is better than the, the religious people, the saints, the super saints. In fact, the Pharisees, this is what the Pharisees would do. They would make rules to help them keep the rules that they had made to help them keep the law of God. Now, when was the last time you had a rule book that helped you keep the word of God? We don't do that. The the Pharisees weren't bad people. They were the religious elite. And yet Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you're not going to heaven. Well, there's another verse of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. It says, "Work, work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. How can you and I be holy if our righteousness can't even exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees? And the answer, and I love this, this is, this is the life of blessing right here. The person who, remember Psalms 24, 3 and Psalms 24, 4, David saying, who can ascend to the Lord? And, he, and he's saying, the person who comes and and asks to be purified. And verse 5 says he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That's an incredible 
thing. Look at the two things. They'll receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of salvation. So let me just talk first about the righteousness part. When Jesus said, accept your righteousness, exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. There's nothing that I'll ever be able to do that'll make me good enough to get into heaven. But what I can do is I can ask God to cleanse me, to purify my heart, to create in me a clean heart. Because what happens, Galatians says that I take on the righteousness of God. That's the beauty of being a person who just humble themselves and opens their hands and says, Father, wash me and you'll be blessed with his righteousness. I cannot get good enough to get God. But God says, you know what? I'll just cover you with my righteousness. And so all the germs that you pick up in life and all the infections and all the bacteria and all that's wrong with life, I'm just going to cover you up and I'm going to wash you. And so when God sees me, God doesn't see my filth, but he sees his righteousness. Wow, what an incredible blessing to know that the God of heaven looks down on me and doesn't see how wrong I am, but he sees how right he is. Because I become a reflection of who he is. I become a reflection. Oh, that's so beautiful. I become a reflection of who he is just by recognizing. And I don't want you to come in here with. Now, if you came here today and you feel like your hands are filthy, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. But I just as a person, just as an individual, every day of my life, I just want for God to be cleansing to be cleansing my hands, to be washing me, to making me pure. And I don't want to come into Sunday morning hoping that I can just feel God's presence. No, 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 no. I want that to happen on Monday. And I want it to happen on Tuesday. Because we don't just wash our hands one day a week. Can you imagine if we went back in time and we just took one bath a week? You just washed one time. Some of you I know do that, but, but I'm talking about if all of us did that. If we all were like you. We just wash our hands one time a week. We wouldn't do that because we understand there's some things. While we have Saturday morning prayer, every Saturday morning at 9 a.m., we have prayer here in the sanctuary. It's an amazing time. I can't tell you how there are not words to express how beautiful Saturday morning prayer is. I encourage you to be a part of it every morning, every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. But he says we'll receive blessing and righteousness. And I want to talk about the blessing part just for a moment. The person that God blesses is not the person who has his act all together, but it's the person who comes and just asks to be made clean before God. It's not the person who's checked all the boxes, and maybe you've been in church for 80 years and you've never missed a Sunday, and every Sunday you've brought your tithe check before the Lord, and you've volunteered for every committee that's ever existed, and you've taught children's, and you've changed diapers, and you've done it all. That, that I believe that God will bless you for that, but what this verse says is that the person who just comes and says, Father, I am unclean, but I want you to make me clean. I'm impure, but I want you to make me pure David says God blesses that person and I believe in that and I want to be blessed today if you agree with that will you stand to your feet and together let's clap our hands and worship clap your hands as big as you can to a great God who loves us and blesses us washes us purifies us I want to be clean before God and just to come before him Every day, Father, cleanse me. Make me clean. Create me a clean heart. David says, God blesses that man. God blesses that woman. Just a moment. I'm going to pray, but before I do, I want you to know something. There's an open area down front. It's an area that we have intentionally left open. And here's why we leave it open. So that you can take a step of faith. It's a, a physical act that says, I am taking this step to say, God, I'm serious about this. Now, you can pray right where you are, and and there's nothing wrong with that. I don't want you to feel bad about it. You can pray right where you are. But if you want to step out today and just say, Father, I want to be clean. I want to be pure. I want to be washed. I I want all the filth. I want all the germs to be off of me, the spiritual germs, the spiritual bacteria, the spiritual infection. I just want it all off of me. I want it out of my life. If you just want to take that step and, and pray that prayer, there'll be others that are coming this morning. I want to invite you to come. Our, our band is, is going to be singing. But I want to invite you to bow in prayer with me. And if you'd like to come, go ahead and come. 
in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for every single person that is here today. I pray that you would touch us, Lord. I pray that you would touch our hearts, Lord Jesus. I don't know what's all in me, Lord, but I know I want to be clean. I want to be pure. I want to be holy before you. I want to stand righteous before you. And so, Father, I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, to wash me. I'm asking you to pur purify me. I'm asking you to make me white as snow. I'm asking you for help. I'm asking you for healing. I'm asking you to make me whole, Lord Jesus. I want, Lord Jesus, to just for your love to flow over me. For your love to flow over me. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.